At the beginning of the 20th century, China looked much the same as it had for hundreds of years. The country was still ruled by an emperor. Men wore their hair in long queues as a sign of subservience to the ruling dynasty. In the old days, barbers carried all their stuff on a shoulder pole, and they worked in the street. If a barber saw a person who had no queue, he could report him. And if he did so, the person could be beheaded. The saying was, keep your hair or lose your head. Beneath the traditional appearance, there was growing discontent with imperial rule. In 1911, a military revolt spread around the country and the emperor was overthrown. Men cut off their queues in a symbolic gesture of revolution. Sometimes at the city gate, I saw people with big scissors. Whenever they saw someone with a queue, they cut it off. I saw people crying, saying, now they say we are revolutionaries. What are we supposed to do? The cutting of queues was only the beginning of the revolution. The Republic of China was declared. The country was soon caught up in an ideological battle. Two men led the struggle, Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. The conflict transformed world politics, for in 1949, China became what it is today, the largest communist state on earth. This is the story of China in revolution. Public, the central government was weak and ineffective. Dozens of military commanders called warlords moved into the political vacuum. In the early days of the Republic, the warlords fought each other. When I was a child in Guangxi province, I saw so many battles. You can't imagine how many battles were fought. Lots of people were so scared, they just went and hid. When warlords got into a fight, people's lives were completely devastated. The warlords were a diverse group. The warlord of Manchuria was a major figure in national politics. The opium warlord made a fortune growing poppies. The Christian general was said to baptize his troops with a fire hose. Many warlords were landlords. They were often supported by a certain foreign power. In the early years of the Republic, China was torn apart by foreign powers. For instance, Guangxi and Guangdong provinces were under the influence of England and Yunnan of France. Since the 19th century, England, France, Germany, the United States, and Japan had traded with China. They based their interests in the major ports around the country. Most foreigners lived in special areas called concessions, which they controlled with their own local governments. We didn't have the term imperialism. The term came later. We called them foreign devils. They were devils to us. 
Why did we hate foreigners? We hated any foreigner, any foreign country that wanted to divide up China. It was called divide up then, not invade. They wanted to divide up China just like cutting a melon into pieces. People used to say, now you want to divide up our country, you foreign devils, you're bastards. In May 1919, for the first time, Chinese took to the streets to protest this dividing up of their country. They saw that the problems of imperialism and warlords had pushed China to the verge of collapse. The demonstration sparked a vocal nationalism and an intense search for political solutions. One of the few political leaders addressing these problems was Sun Yat-sen. Sun was the leader of a coalition group called the Nationalist Party. He was a charismatic man whose speeches attracted many to his cause. Sun knew that the first thing he needed was an army to defeat the warlords and unite the country. He appealed to Western governments for money for his cause. At the time, none of the imperialist countries wanted to help us. Only the Soviet Union wanted to help us. The Soviet Union had no friends in Asia, so they had to work with us. England and the other countries didn't want us to be united. It appeared the Soviet Union did want to help us. China had to be united, so of course we cooperated with them. One condition of Soviet help was that the Nationalist Party allow members of the newly formed Chinese Communist Party to join. Sun agreed, and in 1924, the Soviets helped him set up a military academy just outside Canton. The Wampoa Academy quickly became a magnet for patriotic youth from all over China. Some were nationalists, some were communists. Some were not affiliated with any party. They trained for a military campaign that would one day unite the country, the Northern Expedition. Sun appointed his protege, Zhang Kai-shek, commander of the academy. Zhang was a professional soldier. Like many of his generation, he had attended military school in Japan. He had worked with Sun for over a decade. Zhang's son remembers what his father and Sun Yat-sen talked about. Although I wasn't usually included in their day-to-day -day conversations, there were times when they were walking, having tea, when I heard them talking about national affairs. And when they talked about national affairs, they were very serious, very enthusiastic. They wanted to build up China, because in the East, we had lived under autocracy for too long. Zhang was the commander of all the cadets and of the academy's staff. Many of China's future leaders were under his command. One of them was a young Communist Party member, Zhou Enlai. Zhou was the director of the political education department. Under his direction, the cadets watched and performed plays with simple political messages. Without revolution, there was no hope for this country, so political education was given on the front. Songs played quite a big role. The song goes like this. As his army trained, 
Sun and his wife, Sung Qingling, sailed to Beijing to negotiate with the city's warlord. But Sun was ill with cancer. He died soon after arriving in Beijing on March 12, 1925. Sun was revered as the father of the Chinese Republic. There was no one of his stature to take over the leadership, and a struggle for power in the party began. Chiang Kai-shek emerged the victor. In June 1926, he was appointed commander-in-chief of the Northern Expedition, the campaign to unite the country. A month later, the young army set out. patriotic enthusiasm, they won victory after victory. In just six months, they defeated 34 warlords and they swept up to central China. All along the way, the people welcomed us. For example, they would boil water and cook sweet potatoes by the side of the road where our troops were passing. They would say, brothers, come and eat and drink. Help yourselves. The army was well disciplined then. And so the soldiers and the officers, they always paid for whatever they ate and drank. When the Northern Expedition Army reached our region, they held mass rallies. Everybody went. At the rallies, speakers talked about the cooperation between the nationalists and the communists. They called for the defeat of the northern warlords and the imperialists, and they asked peasants not to pay land rent and debts. I didn't know much about revolutions then. I didn't know a thing about communism or opposing imperialism. But it seemed like a good idea to fight exploitation and the northern warlords. Many in the army's propaganda teams were communists. They explained the goals of the northern expedition, and they called for the end of many deeply ingrained social customs. Wang Ping soon joined the communists. We knocked down Buddha statues in the temples. Foot binding was still popular where I lived, and we urged young girls not to bind their feet, and women who had already done it to undo their feet. At first, we didn't know better. And often we ordered people to do things against their will. If a young woman refused to cut her hair, several of us would hold her and cut it anyway. I didn't know what they were up to, communism or whatever, but I saw that they made trouble. They tried to destroy our religion, our family system, and our ethical structure. For instance, young people's respect for the old. My father told me that the biggest fault of communism was that it was inhuman. 
So what seemed to be cooperation between the nationalists and the communists during the northern expedition was actually only our temporary concession. So we wanted to purge the party, but it was a pretty dangerous thing to do. We could have been finished off. Both sides might move at the same time. The communists were all among us. The problem was how to do the purge. Zhang planned to purge the communists when his army reached Shanghai. Here, communist workers led by Zhou Enlai had formed armed guards and taken control of the city. They were completely unaware of Zhang's plan to break them and they eagerly waited for his army to arrive. Nationalist troops moved into Shanghai. Chang struck on April 12th, 1927. About one in the morning, I saw some guys in plain clothes run over. Our guards asked them the passwords, and they began to shoot. We were already surrounded from all sides, and there were machine guns positioned at the intersections on the streets. They were standing there. Back at headquarters, all our weapons were taken away. They warned us, your workers' guards are disbanded. Go home and don't make trouble. Chiang Kai-shek's army was in firm control of Shanghai. Communists and workers held a huge demonstration to protest the betrayal. There were about 100,000 workers there. They marched down the street towards the machine guns, which fired. And immediately more than 100 people died. Many more were wounded. Many, many were injured. It was raining that day. Bashan Road was a river of blood. I remember it was drizzling. And I saw many people lying in the mud, still moving. It was very sad. When they arrested us, they beat us with rifle butts. Yes, rifle butts. Some of us were hit on the head and were bleeding. Even then, all we said was, good. That was how we showed our defiance. So they hit us and we said, good, good, and we grit our teeth. Chang's purge spread around the country. Unions were closed. Communists and left-wing organizers were arrested. Thousands were executed. Only days after the purge in Shanghai, Zhang established a national government in Nanking. He now controlled China's economic heartland, and over the next few years, he expanded his control. The success of the Northern Expedition earned Zhang tremendous prestige, and he adopted the title Generalissimo. Zhang had made himself the heir to Sun Yat-sen. He strengthened this position by having Sun's body brought to the new capital in an epic journey.
He married Sun Yat-sen's sister-in-law, Sung Mei Ling. She came from a wealthy Methodist family. She had gone to school in the United States, and her English was excellent. Her charm was a valuable asset to Jang, for he was a difficult, aloof man who gained respect, but not affection. To many, especially in the cities, it seemed a new era was beginning. People were more open to the West than ever. Jang's government began modernization programs. The modernization is the way we keep our ancient traditional virtues, but we adopt Western technologies and Western modern social science in a way that brought to the poor. Specifically, I noticed the medicine, the building of new hospitals. It was a time of construction. Transportation and communications were modernized. The currency system began to be unified. Education was expanded. Chiang Kai-shek appointed Chen Li-fu a top advisor. I organized and modernized the party. We made it impossible for the communists to operate. I used American techniques. They used Soviet techniques. Vast security organizations were set up. A top priority was to prevent renewed communist growth in the cities where remnants of the party had gone underground. Chen Zui worked for the security police. We knew they were communists by their speeches, their posters, or the articles they wrote. Or if we searched their homes, we'd find communist papers. That was the correct way. But if we had doubts, we'd say, better to kill an innocent one by mistake rather than let a bad one go. After all, they were fighting the nationalists for power. In spite of the security police, the communists began to rebuild support in cities where working conditions were often brutal. In factories, child labor was common. In silk production, very young children worked plucking cocoons from boiling water. I came to Shanghai when I was 12. We were so miserable. You had to work 17 hours a day. Later, a progressive worker in the factory told us that people were not born to be poor. One was poor because of the exploitation by others. There is exploitation by the capitalist on one hand and exploitation by the labor contractor on the other. You do the work and he takes the money. I had no idea what revolution meant. All I thought was that the worker made sense and that he cared about us poor people. Well, he said, there is a country where there is no oppression and no exploitation, where everybody has a job and food. All we dreamed of then was of having food. So when we heard of this country, we wondered where it was. If only our country could be like that. That's what we hoped for. So we liked to listen to him, and we felt we could do whatever he told us. We would follow him even if we had to risk our lives. What country was that? He wouldn't tell us which country it was. It wasn't until later we knew that what he referred to was the Soviet Union. Chinese communist leaders believed that the revolution would be led, as Marx had written, by workers in the cities. 
But a small group in the party believed the key to revolution lay in the countryside, where most of China's people lived. This renegade group was based in Jiangxi province. It was led by Mao Zedong. Mao came from a prosperous peasant family. He was a founding member of the Communist Party. He had worked with the nationalists at the military academy in Canton, training students to organize peasants. After Chiang Kai-shek's purge, Mao returned to the countryside. By 1927, he and a small group were organizing peasants in Jiangxi province. Conditions made the area a fertile ground for communist activities. <laughs> In South China, there were huge gaps between rich and poor. Rents were high, and taxes were often collected decades in advance. Landlords were called the masters of the earth. One of the four tyrant landlords, by the name of Joe, came to our house and saw my 15-year-old sister and took her to be his wife. He not only wanted to take my sister, he also wanted me to be his maid. I was only seven. My father refused. So he demanded 1,000 silver dollars to buy a maid instead. My father didn't know what to do. Rather than let me be a maid, my father sold me as a child bride. People told me if I joined the revolution, I would have my freedom. I could choose who I wanted to marry. If I didn't join, I'd have to marry this man who was over 30. So I thought if revolution could save me from this, I would join. The communists organized peasant associations and began social reforms. Their actions unleashed pent-up hatred of local landlords, and violent class struggles soon erupted. He smashed the landlord's opium pipes and took away his grain and clothes. He started looking for his money. The landlord wasn't home. His wife was hiding in the attic where rice straw was stored. We found her. We questioned her for several days, and then we killed her. We gave the grain to those who had nothing to eat. Some got about 50 pounds, some got 100. We gave the clothes to those who just didn't have any, so the poor were really eager to join us. By 1930, the communists had set up a government in Jiangxi. Mao had joined forces with Zhu De, another veteran revolutionary. Their men formed the Red Army, which Liu Hanshao joined. I often saw Chairman Mao. He was tall and thin. When he went out, he rode a white horse. We didn't have cars then. When he went to work, he would be followed by eight security guards, three to carry lanterns and two to carry his lunchbox. He wouldn't eat in someone's home. He took his meals wherever he went. Sometimes when there was a meeting, he would stand on a mound and shout slogans. He would shout, Advance to Nanjiang! Advance to Nanking! Take Chiang Kai-shek alive! (laughs) 
Although the communist area was relatively small, many nationalists were frightened by the violent events there. Chiang Kai-shek was concerned. The people under attack, the middle and upper classes, were the base of his support. He launched a series of military campaigns in Jiangxi. They were defeated. Our main forces would lure their troops, lure them into the mountains, like we did in the battle at Longgang. We would lure them in and then pull back. This is called pulling back your fist before you strike. It was like drawing them into a bag. And suddenly we'd surround them and wipe them out. Understand? We'd lure the enemy deep, deep into the Soviet area. And then suddenly surround them. We wiped out their 18th division this way. All 9,000 of them, from the commander down to the cooks. Not one escaped. This is called mobile or guerrilla warfare. Zhang's forces were defeated by these guerrilla tactics four times, but he continued to attack. In 1934, he launched an ideological offensive called the New Life Movement, a mixture of traditional Confucian values and European fascism. He hoped to create a disciplined and orderly society by reforming social behavior. People were instructed to button their clothes, stand straight, and not to eat noisily. The movement only reached a small section of the middle class and failed to solve the peasants' problems. But Zhang's fifth military campaign was a success. In an all-out effort, Zhang had gathered nearly one million soldiers and all the military machinery he could muster, and he changed tactics. We adopted the tactic of moving step by step, the stronghold tactic, do you understand? For instance, I could walk 20 miles a day, but instead of 20, I would only do 10. Then I would stop and dig trenches and build blockhouses. Since the communists didn't have cannons, they couldn't take well-defended blockhouses. So our troops worked very hard to build them, and we wouldn't advance until a place was firmly in our control. This was how we tightened our stranglehold on the communists. As the nationalists began their new tactics, the communists changed theirs. That was when our party made one of its biggest mistakes, the biggest. What happened was that the Communist International sent an advisor, Li De, whose original name was Otto Braun. He claimed that the golden age of guerrilla warfare was over and that it was now time to develop positional and regular warfare. When Mao heard this, he realized that he and Li De would never agree. And after that, Mao didn't go to any more meetings of the military committee. Communist Party leaders supported Otto Braun, the German Comintern representative. Mao lost his position as head of the government, and his guerrilla tactics were abandoned. Then we used blockhouse warfare to deal with their blockhouse warfare. It was tit for tat, but of course it didn't work. They had planes and cannons. We had nothing. So the communist area shrank and shrank. The nationalists were winning. 
the communists had already lost much popular support because of their violent class struggle. By the summer of 1934, they were losing badly. We were being killed off. The revolution wasn't plain sailing. There were people who wavered and were traitors. They saw the situation was going from bad to worse, and they changed with the wind. Communist organizers were arrested by the nationalists. A nationalist official wanted to bail me out of prison to force me to be his concubine. I didn't want to, but they threatened me, saying, if you won't, we'll put a firecracker in your vagina and light it. Aren't you afraid? Sitting or standing, I was just as tall as anyone else. Why should I be someone's concubine? I didn't want to, but what could I do? Finally, they took a red-hot wire this long and forced it through my leg. One from this side, and then from that side. They put the hot wire through my leg. I still have the scars. I was hung up by the arms. I was tortured three times, and then they let me down. I was too numb to feel any pain. My interrogation went on from nine in the morning till four in the afternoon. Then they dragged me back to my cell and said, tomorrow we'll send a platoon of soldiers and rape you to death. That really frightened me. I wasn't afraid of being killed, but how could I stand being raped? Though they were just threatening me, they really made it look real. When I was taken out the next morning, there really was a platoon of soldiers waiting. The officer said, just look at those men. If you don't confess, you'll be raped to death, right here. I said, I don't know who is a communist, and I'm not a communist leader. I'm just a laundry woman. I didn't tell them a thing, and in the end, they sent me to the concentration camp at Zhejiang. They never got anything out of my mouth. In October 1934, nearly 87,000 communists broke out of the nationalist blockade. They began a forced retreat which became known to the world as the Long March. For over a year, they walked an average of 17 miles a day, often through hostile territory. Nationalist troops chased them much of the time. The soldiers crossed 24 rivers and climbed 18 mountain ranges, and they walked more than 6,000 miles. For the survivors, it is remembered as one enormous battle going on forever. By the time we got to the Xiang River, we had lost half our troops. We lost 30 to 40,000 people. They weren't battle casualties. We lost them on the road. We were on the march day and night. Everyone was complaining bitterly. We didn't know where we were going. Chairman Mao was out of power. He marched with the troops. When they reached Zuni, meetings were held. Otto Braun and his supporters claimed that the nationalists had won because they were stronger. Mao said it was because Braun's tactics were wrong. For the first time, Zhou Enlai openly sided with Mao. Zhou Enlai disagreed. Zhou did not think we had lost because of the enemy's strength, but because of our own strategic and tactical mistakes, since we had won in the past. Then Mao spoke. The atmosphere was calm. Everyone was reasonable. In the end, most decided that Li De and Bo Gu were wrong. Most people agreed with Mao's ideas and wanted Mao as our leader on the long march. We were so happy. We called an officer's meeting. We had a meal, two dishes. 
you know, we were banging on the tables with our chopsticks. Yeah, yeah, banging on the tables. We were so happy we were dancing. We supported Mao. That's what it was like, I'm telling you. The meeting was a victory for Mao and his belief in guerrilla tactics. He became the leader of the Long March and soon of the entire Communist Party. Otto Braun lost his influence. From this time on, the Chinese Communists received virtually no help from the Soviet Union. The march went on. The soldiers continued to face the threat of relentless nationalist attack and nature, which was often just as lethal. When they crossed the snowy mountains, most of the troops who came from the south were completely unprepared. It was snowing, and there were hailstorms. I had to stop because it was too slippery, and if I fell off the edge, it would be all over, and it would be easy to fall off. So I decided to take my shoes off and walk barefoot. When my feet touched the snow, ah, it was impossible. The coldness started from my feet and slowly climbed up my legs. My legs went numb. I couldn't walk. Then I saw Yen Chen Ching. He was wearing a pair of straw sandals, and he had an extra pair. He couldn't stop walking, so he just threw the sandals to me and kept going. By then, the cold was already up to here. When it gets to your heart, you die. After I put on the straw sandals, I stamped my feet for a few minutes. And I could feel my legs again, and I could walk. I still have a photo of us. If it weren't for him, I'd have died in 35 in the snowy mountains. Hundreds did die of cold, altitude sickness, and exhaustion. The shared hardships forged firm bonds between the soldiers and earned Mao unswerving loyalty. Mao Zedong gave me his ration to eat. Three little steamed buns in a little bowl this big. At first, I didn't know that it was Mao's. In one bite, I ate two of them. When I found out it was his meal, I stopped eating. He said, you must eat. You still have to march. He forced me to eat the last one. So Ma was very kind, very kind to his subordinates. He took good care of us. The army now had to cross the grasslands. More people died here than on any other part of the march. There was nothing there, absolutely nothing. As far as you could see, all there was was marsh, the endless marsh, no trees, no houses, nothing. Stepping on the grass was like stepping on bean curd. It was soft. From time to time, someone stepped in the wrong spot and fell into the mud. If you fell in up to here, it was all over. When the mud was up to your chest, no one could save you. You could die at any second, you just couldn't tell. We finally got hold of a newspaper and learned that there was a communist base in northern Chanxi province. It was only then that we decided to go there. We needed to rest and regroup. We knew it was extremely poor there, but we had nowhere else to go. The communists reached Yan'an, the end of the long march in the fall of 1935. 95% of the Red Army had been lost. <laughs> 
But Mao didn't lose confidence. He asked us a question. Although there are now only six or seven thousand of us left, are we stronger or weaker than before? His answer was that we were stronger. He said the people who remained were gold. Chiang Kai-shek had nearly wiped out the communists. But he faced another threat, a foreign threat, which many considered more dangerous than the communists, Japan. For years, Japan had had economic interests in North China and Manchuria. Throughout the 1920s, it expanded its interests and defended them with increasingly hostile military activity. Japan's aim was to colonize China. The Japanese posed the greatest threat to the warlord of the region, Zhang Shiliang. Zhang Shiliang was one of the most powerful men in China. He was the Generalissimo's second in command and he retained his own huge, well-equipped army. In September 1931, the Japanese attacked Zhang Shuliang's troops. We bore the brunt of the attack. The brigade commander gave orders. First, he telephoned me and asked me about the situation. Then he gave the order, don't resist. You are not permitted to resist. I pointed out that the enemy had already begun to attack. He said then, collect the soldiers' weapons and hide them in the storehouse. I said that there was no way I could collect the soldiers' weapons and hide them when the enemy was shelling us. He said, then why don't you withdraw? I said, I have only received an order to offer no resistance. I have no order to withdraw. He said, it would be better if you withdraw, otherwise you will be held responsible. Then the phone was cut off. The Chinese troops did not resist, and the Japanese quickly seized control of all of Manchuria. Chiang Kai-shek, afraid the Japanese military would crush China, had chosen a policy of non-resistance. His deputy commander, Zhang Shuliang, protested the situation. Many held him responsible. Others believed he had received orders from Chiang Kai-shek, and they blamed the government. We should have resisted. If I had been brigade commander, I would not have withdrawn. I would have resisted, resisted until daylight. When a foreign army attacks the cities of another country in broad daylight, I don't think that can be justified to the world. We have a saying, an army is maintained for a thousand days to be used for one. Why didn't they fight? I was very angry. The Japanese used Chinese protests as an excuse to attack Shanghai. This time, there was hard-fought resistance. Hello, everybody. This is Clay Gibbon speaking. This was the last stand, the last barricade of the Chinese forces of the 19th Root Army that opposed the advance of the Japanese Marines through these ruins. Hardly a month ago, families lived in these places. Fathers, mothers, and children. This was all that they had in the world. In that part of Cha Pei occupied by the Japanese, all means of communication are being destroyed. All Chinese found in this quarter are forced to undergo a thorough search as snipers. Possession of arms is taken as conclusive evidence of guilt, and the punishment is certain death. A ceasefire was declared in Shanghai 
but prospects for peace were dim. On March 1, 1932, Japan set up a puppet government in Manchuria, which they renamed Manchukuo. They installed the former boy emperor, Puyi, now a young man, as head of state. The Chinese were angered and humiliated by the Japanese attacks and by the government's response. These feelings were expressed in demonstrations, the arts, and in feature films. demonstrations against Japan were quickly suppressed by the government. Chiang Kai-shek was afraid these disturbances would provoke another attack which China would not survive. We weren't ready. We couldn't let a little event trigger a war between China and Japan before we were ready to fight. The best way out was to persuade the Japanese to give up the idea of invasion. We tried everything. The nationalist policy was that to resist foreign aggression, the country first needs internal pacification. This was stated by Chiang Kai-shek, and it was in all the papers. It was absolutely necessary to wipe out the communists before we could fight Japan. Mao and Zhu De knew that Zhang would strike while they were still weak from the long march. In an effort to prevent this and to harness popular anti-Japanese feeling, Mao called for the nationalists to unite with the communists against Japan. Mao declared, we cannot even discuss communism if we are robbed of a country in which to practice it. But Zhang continued his plans to attack the communists. Again, Zhang Shuliang, seen here next to Zhang, disagreed. He and his men only wanted to fight Japan to recover their homeland. But they could not make the Generalissimo change his mind. In December 1936, in a desperate act which shocked the country, Zhang Shuliang ordered his commander kidnapped. Sun Ming Zhu and some heavily armed soldiers stormed Chiang Kai-shek's residence. When I got to the bedroom, I saw that it was a mess and no one was there. I felt Chiang Kai-shek's bed. It was still warm, so I knew he hadn't been gone long. So we went up, and behind the hill, I saw him squeezed between two rocks. It was a spot that everyone called Tigerstone Rock. He was standing there. He was very frightened. His face was covered with dirt. He was in pajamas because he hadn't had time to get dressed. I saluted and said, please, Generalissimo, come quickly. I was afraid that someone might shoot him. I felt a heavy responsibility. The day he was kidnapped, our central committee immediately held meetings. In the evening, we held an emergency meeting. Everyone was trying to figure out how to save him. Madame Chang flew to Xi'an. Chiang Kai-shek feared he would be put on trial and executed. If anything should happen to Mr. Chang, no one in China would be able to fight Japan. Nobody would be able to stop Japan, and the Japanese would certainly march into China. 
That would be certain. No one would resist. All China watched as his fate hung in the balance. China, the Paris of the Orient. In newsreels of the 1920s and 30s, life here looked fun, an exotic mix of East and West. The reality of China was different. Most Chinese lived in the country, where their lives continued largely untouched by the 20th century. China were about to be engulfed in years of violent conflict, years which would dramatically change their country and their lives. China's leader, Chiang Kai-shek, faced two major threats to his power. The communists, led by Mao Zedong, and the Japanese. They controlled most of North China and planned a full-scale invasion. Many Chinese demanded that Chiang's government fight Japanese aggression, but he was afraid the Japanese military would crush China, and he refused. In December 1936, anti-Japanese feeling boiled over and created an astonishing crisis. Chiang Kai-shek's deputy, in an effort to force his commander to resist Japan, kidnapped him. New thunder over China, a storm which the world fears. Through the team faces the shocking news of the kidnapping of Chiang Kai-shek, who is given credit for unifying the nation. Some say the most ominous kidnapping in history which threatens world catastrophe. And now again, the whole world... As the world waited, Madame Zhang flew to be with her husband. Zhou Enlai, for the communists, went to help negotiate. The negotiations went on day after day. Finally, Zhang was released. Everyone had recognized that he was the only man who could lead the country. And he had at last agreed to work with his old enemies, the communists, against Japan. It was the beginning of the United Front. Mao Zedong's communists and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists would stand up to Japanese aggression together. Here's where it started, the Marco Polo Bridge, a few miles southwest of Peiping. On July 7th, 1937, fighting broke out on this bridge between Chinese and Japanese troops. Within days, Japan launched a full-scale invasion of China. It was the beginning of World War II in Asia. The Japanese easily overpowered United Chinese resistance. They took Beijing in days and then Tintin. The Japanese swept inland. In 
October 1937, they arrived outside Mehua village, a few miles from these scenes. Japanese devils entered our village from the west side. They started killing and burning their way through the village. They were just brutal. They killed 46 families and even every animal they saw. Then they got to my home. We were hiding in the cellar. Japanese devils shot into the cellar. We children all cried. I want to get out. I want to get out. When my father got up, three devils stripped him to the waist and tied him up. He was tied up with more than ten other men. I was put in the pit. It was full of people. They'd been there a long time. The Japanese kept bringing more and more people. I was there for hours. Later, about another 200 people were pushed in. The pit was full. Bullets were whistling. The bullet hit my hand. I felt numb and hot. It didn't hurt. I didn't move. It got dark. I ran away. The Japanese killed and burned for three days and nights. Then they left. My grandfather and mother started looking for my father's body. They found it in that big pit. There were bullet holes in his chest. He was killed by the Japanese devils. When I got home, I pushed the door open. It was quiet. No one was there. I wondered what had happened to them. I looked everywhere and I couldn't find them. I went outside. I saw that there was fresh earth in the courtyard. I thought someone must be buried in it. And I went over to the well. The winch had been torn out. People were in there, too. I asked a couple of people to help me. I found my grandmother, mother, and two sons buried in the earth. I pulled my wife and three-year-old out of the well. I hadn't seen them for just a few days. And now none of them could ever talk to me again. It was too horrible. I buried them. That's all. Shanghai was bombarded. There were huge civilian casualties. Nationalist troops fought hard, but they were forced to retreat. Shanghai fell in November 1937. In just five months, the Japanese had captured half of China's seaboard. Chiang Kai-shek and his wife appealed to the world for support. To you, who are enjoying the serenity and security of your own homes, I wish to bring a message from the women of war-ridden China. It is this, if you wish to avoid the calamities that are befalling China now and the killing and mutilation of your loved ones and your fellow beings, boycott Japanese goods. The battle for the capital, Nanking, was fierce. Again, the Japanese overpowered nationalist resistance. 
December 1937, the Japanese entered the city and they began to butcher civilians. An estimated 200,000 men, women and children were massacred. It was called the Rape of Nanking. By June 1938, Zhang was desperate. He ordered the dikes of the Yellow River broken, hoping the flood would stop the Japanese forces. The people in the area were not warned. For them, it was catastrophic. Eleven cities and thousands of villages were flooded. Millions were made homeless. Hundreds of thousands died. And the Japanese continued. They had taken all of Chiang Kai-shek's power base. Now he adopted classical military strategy to trade space for time. Taking advantage of China's huge size, the government and the army retreated thousands of miles inland. Schools, universities, and businesses followed, and people. From all over occupied China, millions left their homes and fled in a massive exodus. The government moved to Chongqing in Sichuan province. It was a remote, undeveloped region ruled by warlords and had never been under Jiang's control. The Japanese bombed Chongqing for weeks at a time. The war effort was hopelessly undersupplied and underfunded. Zhang shored up his government with propaganda and parades. To boost morale, Madame Chiang Kai-shek toured hospitals and orphanages. Chung King held on. Many other Chinese traveled to the northwest, to Yan'an, where the communists had set up their headquarters after the long march. They came because they wanted to fight Japan and because there was a sense here of building a new society. The atmosphere of these early days is remembered as one of enthusiasm and exuberance, the Yan'an spirit. Yan'an was still small enough that most people had contact with the leadership. Mao was developing some of his most important theoretical work. He was adapting Marxism to conditions in China. His theories were studied by all who came to Yunnan. I went to the anti-Japanese university in Yunnan in the fall of 1938. We had classes on current affairs, philosophy and so on. None of us minded the hard conditions. At night, we shared huge beds. Each person had just this little space, about a foot, one next to the other. We got up early in the morning. We did morning drill, and we learned how to use weapons to fight the Japanese. The term was only a few months long. Then we would be sent to the front, and we sang this song.
from Yan'an, the young people were sent to work in villages throughout North China and Manchuria. They recruited anyone who would resist Japan. They also changed the face of North China by initiating moderate reforms, reducing land rent and taxes. They held elections and introduced voting. The communists carefully built rural middle-class support and they avoided the violent class struggle they had used in the past. Our slogan was, if you have money, give money. If you have a gun, give your gun. And if you are healthy, come and fight. We didn't attack the rich. We even allied with landlords as long as they were not collaborators and wanted to resist. I am from a rich farming family. When the party started in our area, why did they come to us, who were upper class? Because the poor peasants couldn't afford to give up their work in the fields. Besides, they were not necessarily more progressive than we were. Women were the most constrained by tradition. Even in the early 1940s, many young girls still had their feet bound and they were often treated as virtual slaves by their families. For example, a woman had no rights in her own family. Since she had no income, she was dependent. When someone knocked on the door asking, is anyone home? She would say, no, there's no one here. See, she didn't even think of herself as a person. Wang Xinlan had married Xiao Hua, a young communist officer. After work, Xiao Hua and I used to walk through the village holding hands. Sometimes after dinner, we would just sit there talking and laughing. They were very envious. They said, you must have done a lot of good in your previous life for God to have given you such a good husband. I said, that's got nothing to do with it. It's because women like me have changed our political status. We are independent people. Among us, men and women are equal. We are equal even though he is the husband and I am the wife. We tried to explain this to them. It was all very surprising to them. The communist call to fight Japan, combined with their moderate social reforms, had a powerful appeal. Throughout North China, the party established a solid base of support. And the resistance they organized was effective. Liang Yang-hung describes how he and a friend ambushed a Japanese regiment which came to their village. These two areas had more than 10 landmines. When the enemy came, we triggered the mines. They got blown up on both sides. We wouldn't let the bastards get away. The enemy came towards us, and the two of us were really happy. The guy with me was called Feng He. I said, what about it, Feng He? You get the officer. I'll get the guy over there. Feng He aimed at the Japanese officer. Bang! He got him right in the head. He keeled over. I pulled my trigger. Bang! Got another one. The enemy sent a regiment with 100 carts. They came to take our wheat, but we didn't lose any. Their carts didn't go back empty, though. They carried the bodies of 60 dead devils. The Japanese responded to communist resistance with a campaign of terror called Burn All, Kill All, Loot All. They decimated any village with communist connections and fragmented communist control of the region. The communists and nationalists were still officially fighting Japan together, bound by the United Front. But there were frequent clashes between the two sides. In January 1941, 
nationalist forces suddenly attacked a communist unit. The unit was wiped out. It was the end of the United Front. Mao sent a message to Chiang Kai-shek. Those who play with fire ought to be careful. If things continue to develop this way, all the people of the country will throw you into the gutter. Chiang's response to a journalist was, the Japanese are a disease of the skin, the communists are a disease of the heart. Chungking, the Japanese continued to bomb Chiang Kai-shek's wartime capital. By December 1941, the war had been going on for nearly five years. Nationalist armies had taken beating after beating. Japan was winning the war. Japan launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, and the United States declared war on Japan. I knew then that Japan was bound to be defeated, bound to lose the war. Today, we, the people of the United States, fighting a desperate rear guard action against the Japs, grimly realize that our future depends upon holding a fighting China as our ally. Well, may we ponder what might happen if China should fall. If the full force of Japan, now deadlocked in China, were released to strike into India, into Australia, into Mexico or Canada, or California. Despite the propaganda, the Allies gave China low priority. They were struggling to survive the war in Europe. General Joseph Stilwell was named the top American commander in China. Stilwell had lived in China and he spoke the language. His job was to keep China in the war and improve its fighting capacity. He commanded Chinese troops, and he believed that, properly trained, they would be among the best in the world. But he railed against the nationalist command. He would speak in expletives to me about the Chinese generalship, uh, because uh, he would find them pig-headed, uh, uh, vacillating, they'd change their mind. Uh, uh, and again, uh, uh, Jiang would not want to commit uh, a large force to uh, gain an objective, he would send it in in driblets, and it would then be consumed by the Japanese in driblets. Stilwell found that the Generalissimo was unwilling to commit his troops against the Japanese because he was saving them for use against the Chinese communists. He had 500,000 of his best troops blockading the area occupied by the Chinese communists. Stilwell soon saw the Chinese war effort was hampered by another problem, corruption. It started at the top with Jiang's inner circle, his wife's family and a handful of his oldest friends. They controlled the economy and made enormous profits from their positions. Jiang himself was never accused of corruption, but he did nothing to stop it, and it spread to all levels in the nationalist government. Those it hurt most were the ordinary soldiers Stilwell was trying to command. Conscripts were treated brutally. They were afraid we would run away, so they would tie five or six men together on the same rope. That's how we traveled. We were strung up in groups. I saw hundreds of our conscripts strung up and pulled along on ropes. At night, to stop them running away, they tied their legs. I saw it with my own eyes. The nationalists had corrupt officers. They put sand in the rice to replace what they had taken. We ate moldy rice with a lot of sand in it. They said we were drafted to fight Japan and defend our homeland. If they really meant it, why didn't they give us food and clothes? Why was there corruption? Poverty. If America didn't have enough food and clothing, corruption would exist there too. As the Chinese saying goes, only when one has food and clothing will he know ethics. 
Nearly one and a half million men died of starvation or illness before ever reaching their units. One out of every ten men drafted during the war. Stillwell and the Foreign Service officers filed reports about nationalist corruption and other problems to no avail. Nationalist censorship and the American media bolstered Jiang's image. Well known to every American is lean, keen Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, undisputed leader and idol of 450 millions of Chinese. In 1943, Madame Jiang visited the United States and charmed Congress and the public. Let us not forget that Japan in her occupied areas today has greater resources at her command than Germany. Let us not forget that during the first four and a half years of total aggression, China has borne Japan's sadistic fury unaided and alone. She repeatedly requested huge amounts of money and supplies for the government. When the U.S. Treasury expressed reservations, Jiang threatened to sign a separate peace with Japan. And so millions of dollars were sent. No one had to account for the money, and much of it simply disappeared. To be fair, I must say that in any government, at any time, there will be situations we don't like. Some unfair and illegal behavior. This can happen in any country, any government, at any time. Especially during a period of bad economic conditions after years of war. Naturally, some people are tempted by material things. In August 1944, a group of American officers flew deep into northwest China to Yan'an. Anxious to improve China's fighting capacity, Stillwell and the American government wanted to know if the communists could be used effectively in the war. The foreign service officers who went to Yan'an were called the Dixie Mission. It was the first official Western recognition of the communists. My first impressions, well, Mao Zedong was uh, a large, uh, even then uh, a slightly tending towards plump uh, individual with uh, a very smooth face, no facial hair that had been noticed. Uh, and he uh, uh, was not what you would call charismatic. He was straightforward, did not dwell on polite uh, phrases at all, uh, but there was no question that he was the boss. Everyone was deferential to him, including people like Zhou Enlai and Zhu De. They, uh, they looked to him, and when he spoke, no dog barked. Mao was now the undisputed leader of the communists. The year before, Mao Zedong thought had become their official ideology. No criticism of Communist Party policies was tolerated. The communists wanted to create a good impression, for they wanted American help in the immediate struggle against Japan, and they hoped for long-term support when the war was over. The American officers spent a year in Yan'an assessing the communists' organization and their military potential. Apart from a few Russian advisors, they saw no evidence of Soviet support. With full U.S. government approval, the Americans instructed the communists on strategy and weaponry. They watched guerrilla tactics. They traveled out from Yan'an and watched the communists attack Japanese blockhouses. They saw that the communists controlled huge areas in the countryside of north and central China. Patrick Hurley, President Roosevelt's personal representative visited. 
His mission was to mediate between Jiang and the communists. When uh, Hurley arrived in Yan'an, the, the plane sat down and uh, the door was flung open and there stood Hurley in his major general's uniform, you know, glistening in his white mustachios and his six feet three and he let out a Choctaw war hoop. And of course, uh, the, the Chinese are much too courteous to, uh, to stand uh, and say, what goes on, you know? Uh, they just, uh, spo I suppose they assume that this is the way foreign devils do, uh, behave when they uh, appear upon a scene somewhere. China was a very complex phenomenon, uh, and it really baffled him, I think. He uh, had great difficulty with identifying who the various Chinese were. Uh, he had, uh, Mao Zedong was Mustang, uh, and the uh, nicknames that grew up there in an attempt to uh, uh, identify people uh, was uh, a, a very clear indication that uh, he really was somewhat at sea, shall we say. Despite cordial appearances, Hurley's mediation went badly and led to deep communist mistrust of him. Hurley supported Chiang Kai-shek and did not seem to take the communists seriously. The foreign service officers made a different assessment. I reported uh, on the communists uh, after my visit there that uh, I thought that they would probably win in China. Uh, and uh, the reason I think that that would happen is that they had the popular support. Uh, I mentioned, I think, at the time that, that they were a democratic force. That was a, a, mis, uh, that was a misnomer. They were a popular force, and they had a popular support. And only in that sense were they democratic. Relations between Jiang and Stilwell were deteriorating. Stilwell, on behalf of the American government, demanded that Jiang make sweeping changes in his army. Stillwell talked about the bad things in Jiang's government and Jiang's arrogance. He also asked that part of Jiang's troops be placed under his direct control and that Americans be appointed high-ranking officers. Jiang Kai-shek did not accept that. But all those were not the main disagreements. The biggest disagreement was that Stilwell wanted to send weapons to the communists to arm communist troops, which was the last thing Jiang Kai-shek wanted. Jiang demanded Stilwell's recall. John Davies asked for a transfer. Almost every American officer with in-depth experience in China was fired or resigned. Jiang now had undisputed control of China's war effort. Stilwell was replaced by General Wedemeyer, who was much more sympathetic to Jiang. And the war with Japan was soon to be over. In August 1945, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, and the Japanese surrendered. In the victory celebrations, Jiang was the hero of China. But the quick end of the war left an important question unresolved. Who would take the Japanese surrender in North China? The communists raced to get their armies north. Nationalist troops were airlifted by America to arrive first. General Lu Zhengcao remembers what Mao said about Chiang Kai-shek. He wants to come down the mountain to harvest peaches. That's what Mao said. Our people and our army had made great sacrifices behind the Japanese lines. 
So we wanted to take the surrender in those areas. I rode all night back to the front. You couldn't say we were harvesting peaches, but we did want to taste a few. Civil war seemed inevitable. Patrick Hurley, now U.S. ambassador in China, persuaded Mao to go to Chongqing for talks with Zhang. The two men had not met in nearly 20 years, since the days of Sun Yat-sen in Canton. Zhang addressed Mao as elder brother, and Mao made the toast, long live Chiang Kai-shek. But the talks led nowhere. President Truman did not give up. He sent General George Marshall to mediate. An agreement was signed and then quickly broke down. The Civil War began. At first, it went badly for the communists. In March 1947, Mao announced to his troops that they would withdraw from Yan'an because of a successful nationalist advance. But Yan'an was only a symbol and not the base of their power. Their real power lay in the vast countryside of North China and Manchuria. It had been built up during the war with Japan when moderate reforms had attracted support from all economic levels of society. Now the communist leadership decided to expand their support by concentrating on the poor they launched a radical land reform movement attacking their old allies in the prosperous middle class. In Li Lao Chi's house, we first drove out his cattle and pigs. Then we took all the furniture, cabinets, and trunks out of his house. We took all his clothes, too. After that, we shut him up in a small room and told him to write a confession. Then the people wanted to struggle with him. They shouted, Li Lao Chi, you must confess honestly. Who did you exploit? How much money have you piled up? Where have you hidden it? You must confess. We struggled with him for a long time. He had buried his silver dollars underground. We got him to confess where he had hidden the money. As the poor divided up the land of the prosperous, many communists were torn between the demands of the party and of their families. Even veteran party members were attacked. When the reforms came, you had to go along with them. Because I was a party member, I had to take the lead. My parents didn't agree with me. Even though they were in charge of the family property, they had to listen to me. At the time of the land reform, my family had a new cart, a horse, a donkey, and about five acres of land. We had a large family and enough food. And so one night, they sealed up our house. All the landlords and rich peasants were locked up in one spot before the mass rally. I went and saw the situation was no good. I was afraid the struggle meeting might go wild. I was scared. The meeting began. My father was Wang De, and they tied him to a post. Everyone in the village was there, and then they went crazy. Some innocent people got beaten, and some bad people got beaten. Village leaders tried to control the mob. They even sat on the landlords to keep them from being torn apart. What they did was wrong. They ignored the facts. If you weren't poor, if you were better off, then you were guilty. 
That's how they reasoned. Land reform had become mob rule. It tore families and villages apart. The communists began to lose support. In December 1947, Mao urged restraint. Five months later, the movement was stopped. The communists tried to minimize the damage and backtracked to their moderate wartime policies. They managed to salvage peasant support. In the cities, people's lives had not improved after the war. Massive economic problems were undercutting Jiang's support. The government's financial policies were chaotic. The currency system changed many times. The old Fabi paper money was changed to the new Fabi paper money. Then that was changed to the gold yuan. Then, when there weren't enough gold yuan, it was changed to the yuan shikai silver dollars. There was also gold, and even American dollars were used. The currency system was in complete chaos. So when people got paid in the morning, they would rush to buy things, because prices would rise by the afternoon. Sometimes the price would double. People had a rough time. The homeless and starving filled city streets. Black market trading and corruption were widespread. To make matters worse, in 1947, floods in the south destroyed the rice crop. And in the north, there was a devastating famine. In response, the United Nations Relief Agency sent millions of dollars in aid. America continued to send vast quantities of war surplus and millions more dollars to help Jiang in his struggle against the communists. Many were certain that Jiang's family was embezzling huge amounts of this aid. He and his wife continued to ask for more. In 1947, President Truman sent Albert Wedemeyer back to China to assess the situation. Although it was clear that Jiang's government was corrupt and losing support, for America there was no alternative. Wedemeyer urged Jiang to effect immediate, drastic political and economic reforms. At the same time, he recommended more U.S. aid. Wedemeyer's recommendation that we continue to support the government of Chiang Kai-shek has to be considered in the context of the times, the times of the Cold War, in which the Chinese communists seemed to be allied with the Russians, and the hope that somehow or other military aid might contribute to the survival of Chiang Kai-shek's government. But American aid could not win the war for Jiang. He made the crucial mistake of overextending his forces in the north. The communists responded with a change in tactics. They mounted a major offensive against the nationalist armies in the cities. The change of tactics worked. By November 1948, after only a month and a half, the communists won control of North China. Nationalist troops were crossing over to us in divisions and armies. When we first got to the Northeast, we had 100,000 troops. Now we were four or 500,000 strong. Our equipment all came from the United States and Chiang Kai-shek. There was a joke among the soldiers. They said that Chang was our best supplier of American weapons. That was the joke. They said that after we win, we'll give him a medal that weighs a ton. 
because he did such a good job for us. After eight years of fighting Japan, nobody wanted to fight anymore. Even I didn't want to fight anymore. Chiang Kai-shek reprimanded me. This war has to be fought. If we don't wipe out the communists, we'll die without a place to be buried. We've got to go all out. I couldn't say anything to that. He was my teacher, my academy commandant. He had been my commanding officer for many years. All I could do was obey. With North China under communist control, the battle for central China began. Huang Wei led Chiang Kai-shek's crack 12th army. Our movements were slow. Our equipment was heavy, cumbersome. We were fighting, retreating, and bringing up reinforcements simultaneously. Our formations were beaten back bit by bit. We would be wiped out in one day, two days' time. So I gave the order to flee. <laughs> that saved some people. On December 15th, we broke out in several places. My deputy commander and I got into a tank and fled. We fled to a place about 15 miles from Chuangduiji. That evening, the evening of December 15th, the tank I was in broke down, couldn't move. So we got out and fled on foot. The communists were everywhere. And they caught me. I became their prisoner. The nationalists failed because we completely lost the people's support. I had heard that during the northern expedition, the people gave us flowers and food. During the war against Japan, the people provided intelligence and helped us resist the Japanese. Once the civil war started, we couldn't find anyone to give us even road directions. There is a saying in China, the water that carries the boat can also overturn it. On January 21, 1949, 11 days after the battle for central China, Chiang Kai-shek resigned. In Shanghai, people were leaving in droves. Chiang Kai-shek and his government retreated to the island of Taiwan. It was carefully planned. They took a huge part of China's art treasures and all of the central bank reserves. U.S. aid followed. The last shipments of arms and ammunition were sent to Taiwan, not to China. The government of Chiang Kai-shek had already made its preparations for transfer to Taiwan. So we never stopped supporting Chiang Kai-shek. Zhang did not give up all hope. My father's first order was for us to examine our past mistakes, both domestic and international. Secondly, we should prepare to recover the mainland. He never said we should fight our way back. 
What we should do was help the people on the mainland overthrow the regime. So we've been making preparations based on this order since the first day in Taiwan. The war continued without Chiang Kai-shek. The communists prepared to cross the Yangtze River, heading for Nanking and Shanghai. They quickly overcame nationalist defenses. With the communists just outside Shanghai, the remaining nationalist police stepped up their anti-communist activities. My husband had been arrested by the nationalists, and I couldn't find him. I was both happy and worried at the same time. Happy because the revolution would soon succeed, that was obvious. And worried because my husband had been arrested, and we didn't know where he was. On October 1st, 1949, we listened to the radio. We heard the ceremony of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Chairman Mao proclaimed that the Chinese people had stood up. All of us were overjoyed. We jumped around. We were really proud and happy. My daughters were very young. They asked why there was so much excitement. I told them they would understand when they were older. As for me, it was the day I'd been working for all my life. October 1st, I was locked up in the war criminals' prison. I had no desire to go on living, but I couldn't just die. I was very stubborn. I really couldn't change the way I thought. So I was locked up in thought reform for 27 years. This man, I think he was a great man. He was a hero. But his methods were the old ones of China. And he lost. I put my life on the line for him. In the end, I was buried alive for him. You could say I was loyal to him to the end. Loyal to the end.
I felt happy on the one hand, because I had been looking forward to liberation so much, and it had come at last. On the other hand, I felt sad, for my husband was dead. But then we thought that people always die in revolution. No death, no victory. Major funding for this program was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and the New York Council for the Humanities. This is PBS.